takes a long time to make a film. I want to be fascinated by that journey. I, I was getting an awful lot of sort of, you know, patronizing kind of pats on the head and they hang in there and, and that's not what I wanted to hear at all. Some of us are jerks, some of us are talkative, some are very quiet. Um, none of that really matters very much. The big thing is taste, taste and judgment. Most people get their first chance to direct by blackmailing their way in. Generally, they have to say, well, if you want me to write the script, you gotta let me direct it. If you want me to act in the movie, you gotta let me direct it. You keep building a spec, you know, or an outline or something, so you're collecting your own intellectual property at all times. It's a long time to make a film. I want to be fascinated by that journey. In a project like Hillbilly Elegy, it was relatability. I love family stories, but I've, I've never had one that was a true story that dealt with characters from rural America, and that's my family's background. I grew up in California, but my mom and dad are from the Midwest. I felt like I just connected with these these characters, this family dynamic and journey, the ways in which they were funny, the dramas that they had to work through. And of course, the always relatable journey of a young guy discovering himself, understanding the strengths that he's inherited, but also overcoming some of the baggage. You gotta think about these kids. What do you think I've been thinking about since I was 18 years old, huh? The biggest thing is to never stop writing. You know, keep building a spec, you know, or an outline or something, so you're collecting your own intellectual property at all times, you know, even while you're, you're going out and starting to take meetings. Now, the development game is not what it once was, and even though you have some heat from having something optioned, uh, you wanna take advantage of every one of those get-to-know-you meetings that you possibly can, and open up relationships with development executives, because that's so important. Interesting rewrite jobs might come your way, those are great for paying the bills, but more importantly, you know, you're developing uh, relationships with the gatekeepers, the people who will, uh, can, can help you, you know, get things done. Um, that's really important, but vital is to not just have, you know, one calling card, okay, you've got an option, that's great. It's you wanna just keep being as productive as you can and um, collaborating, and as this one that's been optioned moves forward, my suggestion would be to stay as nimble and loose about um, continuing to collaborate and take on collaborators. It's been your baby, but that's not really the way film works. You know, now, there are two or three key voices that often enter into the evolution of a screenplay, and you know, the collaborators, directors, uh, producers, studio executives love somebody who can continue to advance by you know having that creative conversation, taking some notes, building upon the good ones, and being smart about editing out and weeding out the ideas that are uh, you know that are not compatible with the with the screenplay. So the more you can demonstrate that, you know, the more you just build goodwill and your own that own creative that muscle that uh, that most great screenwriters need to have. As a young person, a young adult trying to make the transition from sitcom actor to motion picture director, well, I mean. I was getting an awful lot of sort of, you know, patronizing kind of pats on the head and hey, hang in there and, you know, in another 10 or 15 years, I'm, you know, I'm sure somebody will give you a chance to direct. And that's not what I wanted to hear at all. Um, so I had a lot of frustration about that. And I kind of earned my way out by, by making student films myself, by, by writing, and by being fortunate enough to put myself, get myself into a position of, of some leverage by being one of the lead actors on Happy Days, I had some leverage. It had something I could sort of trade with. Most people get their first chance to direct by blackmailing their way in. Generally, they have to say, well, if you want me to write the script, you gotta let me direct it. If you want me to act in the movie, you gotta let me direct it. Um, you know, um, if, if you want this money, this group of investors that I've found, you're gonna have to let me direct the film. And, and that's, nobody really wants to hand a first time director the reins. You know, directors, some of them, some of us are sweethearts, some of us are jerks, some of us are talkative, some are very quiet. Um, none of that really matters very much, although I, you know, I always, I always think that it's nice to be decent to people, but that's me. Uh, it's not imperative. The big thing is taste, taste and judgment. That's what it's all about. And it's, it's, uh, 
it's understanding, you know, what's what exists within the possibilities of the story you're interested in telling, you know, and 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 um, and and how many of those details can you capture? How can you sequence them together in the editing? You know, what does that add up to? And um, it really doesn't much matter how you get there, whether there's a large crew or a small crew, whether it takes a long time or just a little while. What it really matters is what did you get? And what does it mean to other people when you edit it together and share it with them? I think that the number one lesson probably was that trying to achieve a, a quality um, entertainment is something that requires incredibly diligent focus and uh, dedication. Andy embodied that. And at the same time, you could work hard on the creative problem solving. You could, you could respect the audience and, and try to achieve a level of quality, but you could also have fun and laugh. And that, in fact, the, the creative collaborative uh, energy could be really intoxicating and thrilling to be around, but it also required this sort of um, equilibrium between focus, professionalism, and, and an ongoing sense of play, because you are, you are engaging in, in, in sort of make-believe to try to help achieve the, the, the goals of, of any scene, no matter what the genre. Well, we were trying to do um, internet content starting in like about 99, 90, yeah, I think it was 99. And DreamWorks and Imagine combined on a thing called pop.com, which was sort of a gonna, had we kept it going, which we didn't, it might have grown into sort of YouTube. I mean, it was that idea of making short films for the internet, creating an environment where people could upload their their short films and, and, and things like that. And, um, and it, you know, we couldn't get it to work. We, we, we started it, it failed, it just didn't make business sense. We, we were out in front of it and it cost too much and stuff like that. So, um, but, but it, in my mind, I felt like there was a, maybe a, a new kind of um, lower cost sort of television that could be produced that would utilize the, 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 a, a new kind of visual vocabulary that, w that was coming out of reality television um, and docu-TV, like, sort of like cops, but also the reality TV show. And I'd done Ed TV, which was about a reality, I mean, it was before reality TV shows existed, um, the notion of just following people around and. and uh, and, 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 and sort of, you know, Ed TV, they're, they're, they're airing it live. Uh, but um, I felt like that there was a, a way to do a, a, a sitcom that would feel very spontaneous and, and, and could be dance, comedically dance, because you could do more visual humor, you could be more cinematic. You could do. You could have a narrator. You could do flashbacks. You could. You, you could uh, let person say oh, a person say one thing, and then you could expose them for the hypocrites that they are with a, a quick flashback, you know, and things like that. And and um, and it could be a sort of a you know a modern, more cinematic approach to a sitcom. But it would have to be genuinely funny, not just smug. When you're doing something as emotionally um, risky. Um, as, as, you know, sort of working on a TV show or a, or, a, or a movie. I mean, part of it is that you're, 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 you're facing you know, the real possibility of complete public humiliation. I mean, it's not all that unusual for people to just say, oh, that was terrible. Did you see that guy? He's, oh, he was awful. He stinks. And, and so everybody knows that that's out there because they've participated in that same kind of, <laughs> kind of ragging on, on uh, shows and movies. They know, they know you're, that, that you're putting yourself you know, up for that sort, of, um, that, that sort of judgment, you're opening yourself. So as a result, you know, there, there does need to be a kind of trust, but I've found that in the creative community, there's often a, a sort of an instant trust. 
And you can either, in, in, in just one or two conversations, you can actually determine whether that trust exists um, in, in, a, in a relationship or not. My first movie was a car chase comedy, Young People on the Run, called Grand Theft Auto and um, made for $602,000, but the film made a terrific profit, and it, it got me started. I had to, I wrote it with my father, um, and, and I had to star in it in order to get to, to direct it. But that's the last time that I acted in anything that I directed. One of the things that I suggest to almost anybody, and I do it myself from time to time, is whatever the genre, if there's a movie and there's a, there's a, that you particularly like, and there are sequences that you remember and, and that you, you think are cool, watch them over and over again. Watch them a couple of times with, with sound and then watch them a couple of times without sound. Because when you pull the sound out, which is like the final finish that really, in a lot of ways, brings a lot of the, you know, gives a lot of the impact to a scene, you also begin to see really how the filmmakers captured those images. Did they use the same shots over and over and keep cutting back to them? Was it always a different shot and a different angle? Is the camera moving? Is it static? You know, what's the, what's the language that they're using and what does it mean? Um, and it answers so many questions because we, we sort of understand movies intuitively, but when you really start breaking them down and understanding what was done on the day to create that, that sequence of shots that we love, that, me, that has an impact on us, you know, it's like a light goes off. You just begin, it, it simplifies everything and removes a lot of the mystery. Anybody can shoot anything, but it's how you, how you begin to build it and piece it together that I think means the most. And uh, of course, the, the, the edi editorial software is so cool now that, you know, you, any, anybody should take advantage of that and, um, you know, and start putting together, putting together images. The first thing that I do when I step on set is usually hand off my shot list to the script supervisor. Um, or uh, if I haven't built my shot list yet and all I have is a bunch of notes, is, uh, uh, you know, I'm bypassing, you know, uh, st stop off at the porta potty uh, and get a cup of coffee. That's kind of obvious early in the morning. Uh, but um, get out there, look at the set, get a quick report if there are any surprises. Um, is anybody sick? Are your actors okay? Is everybody on time? Uh, is, what's the weather supposed to be? You get a quick, you know, rundown. Then you see if the plan that you made the, the day before still holds, so you know what your first shot's gonna be. And, and then it's really about getting that first shot launched. Sometimes that entails getting the actors there for a rehearsal first. Sometimes you know what the staging is gonna be and you get the camera crew going and then you, you, know, you begin the, the process. If I haven't made a shot list, once I've staged that first one and broken it all down, I'll step aside with the script supervisor and, and jot down a shot list for the entire day. Could be up to 50 shots, uh, but I'll work it out with, with him or her uh, and uh, um, and that's usually about 75% mm, accurate in terms of what we're really gonna do, but it becomes a great organizing game plan. At 65, Ron Howard continues to exhibit a youthful exuberance. For many Americans he knows, he is forever Opie. In reflecting on his latest documentary subject, Luciano Pavarotti, Howard focused on the tenor's drive and willingness to take risks. You come across as an easygoing person, right? That's been your, <laughs> that was your actor persona as well, but there's clearly some well, drive or ambition or <laughs> is there a killer instinct in there? That well, only a respect for the medium. I mean, I think that, look, Pavarotti was, he, he was charming. People loved working with him. They really wanted to work with him. You know, I hope people feel that way about working with me. I bring a lot of joy and excitement to the set with me because, uh, you know, that's the way I feel. You're 65, you've been at this a long time, 61 right? 61 of those years. 61 of 65 <laughs> years. <laughs> but you seem to be busier than ever. As a storyteller, um, it's, it's, uh, it's almost like this buffet. Uh, it's it's uh, um, in incredibly energizing to me. All right, Ron Howard, thank you very much. Pleasure, thanks.